All right, welcome back. Uh, as we decided last time, we're going to cover, I don't want to say a difficult topic, but uh, it's not as easy as maybe reading the life of saints, but it was, it's Lazarus. So we know from the gospel, Lazarus was four days dead and Christ uh, called him from the tombs. And a lot of what I was able to find, I found some interesting talking topics, but you really, you don't find a lot except for that point and moment in Lazarus' life. Lazarus died, he was in a tomb, Christ calls him forth. What else is there to say? There's not a whole lot to say, right? Well, I'm going to try to dig into this a little bit and try to find those things to talk about. The, um, the first thing, so as the story unfolds, we'll say, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, sends an urgent message to Christ saying, Lazarus is sick. possibly dying. I don't think that the word death was actually in that message, but Christ was away from Bethany is where uh, Lazarus was. And he pretty much told his disciples that what Lazarus has, he will not perish from, or he will not, it will not cost Lazarus his life. Now, there's really no, like, he definitely had this, he definitely had that. Essentially, they, they felt or people hypothesized that Lazarus had sepsis. So Christ makes this comment to the apostles, and he stays where he was for two more days. Now, there's a lot of questions on when Lazarus actually died. He could have possibly died when that message was, be sent, was being sent. He could have died after that fact. But Christ stayed two more days where he was knowing that Lazarus was sick. And I thought that was kind of interesting because I know in, in my life that I had a grandfather who was sick. My grandfather had a stroke. There was no question. I got in the car and I drove three hours. If a friend of ours is sick, we try to go visit them or tend to them in their needs. I'm not arguing to say that, you know, Christ was being rude or obnoxious. I don't think that that's what I'm trying to convey. It was just like, to me, in, in my spiritual life, it's like if I know someone, um, Mike Scala, we found out uh, in a morning that he was not doing too well, and the first thing was, I'd have to go see him. It was too late. It was already too late at that point. And then you start to kind of sit back and you think the what-if stories, like, I should have went and visited him last Sunday when I thought I, I should have. I should have done this, I should have done that. And I think it's easy for us as humans to kind of play that card, but we'll find out as we continue with the story of Lazarus that everything is put in its place for a reason. And the reason is to give glory to God. So moving past that, so Christ finally gets back to Bethany. And um, Mary and Martha are there. And I want to kind of dwell on Martha just a little bit because I've read... There's been different Gospels that have Mary and Martha in it, that well, I guess two or three that I know of. But all joking aside, it seems like the Gospel pokes at Martha a little bit more. Pokes at Martha because maybe she's a little bit more of the world. So Christ comes to Bethany, and the first thing when Martha embraces him, which would I think is a good comment, but still... The first comment out of her mouth was, if you were here, he would not have died. And, I mean, first, that's great that you put that much trust. I thought of the centurion uh, in the gospel where a little bit different circumstances, but Christ says, I'll come to your house. He's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not worthy to have you at our home, but I know if you just say the word, my son will be better. 
Um, in this particular situation, Martha makes this comment and Christ kind of, you want to say, snaps back or, you know, challenges that if you believe that I am the resurrection, then he will be saved. And to which she exclaimed that you are, you know, uh, Christ, the, the, my God, my Lord, etc. And I always think back with Martha again that between that specific happenstance and then when we hear about it, I think it's three or four times throughout the liturgical year, the story where uh, Mary and Martha are pretty much welcoming Christ to their home and Martha's worried about hospitality and Mary just sits at the feet of Jesus, listens to his words. And, and Christ kind of came down hard on her where she's, you know, in the gospel it almost sounds like she's complaining and whining and crying that I'm doing everything and she's not doing anything, you know, and it says, tell her to help me. And Christ says, you have it all wrong. And I think even here is Martha made a comment. And Christ says, you got it all wrong again. And that's fair. And, and, and I always like a little chuckle. The story is that I've never grown up with Martha. Martha was not a common name. So now that we have one, at least one in our parish, it's kind of like I can't wait for her to get a little bit older where I could say, Martha, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> you were anxious Poor and Martha. troubled by many things. <laughs> so then, so this exchange happens with Martha, and then Christ asks, where is Lazarus? And one of the things that I try to grab a hold of is, okay, Christ is God. He knows, right? He, he knows where he's at. But he still asks the question, where is he? And so they lead him away to the tomb where Lazarus was. And as they're standing before that, Martha and Mary are weeping extensively. And in that moment, as Christ was before the tomb, he also wept, which was very, very, very powerful for me because you have a lot of questions regarding that. The first question is, okay, he knew what he was about to do, but he's still crying. A lot of questions can come from that. It's like, okay, so why, why would he cry? And my opinion, my thought process on that is that God never leaves us. God, God is with us in our triumphs, but also in our tragedy. Just because the tragedy is there does not mean he's just sitting there watching it happen. He's grieving in our moments of grief. He is um, celebrating with us in the moments of triumph as well. So it's kind of like almost comforting to know that um, how great our God really is to be able to be in that moment with us. And then the other side of the story too is they said that you know Christ was human after all. He's divine and he's also human. The human aspect of it is that <coughs> he loved Lazarus. He loved that whole family from what you read in scripture on it, that he, he very much loved that family to the point that, um, well, I, I, you obviously saw it. <laughs> he was very, very troubled by the death of Lazarus. So then the next thing happens. Christ is about to, do something that no one that time thought would happen. He said to open the tomb. And here comes Martha again. Martha tells Christ, I, paraphrasing, I don't know if you want to do that. He's been dead four days and it's not going to smell too good in there. And again, Christ fires back at him. It's like, <laughs> pretty much, didn't I just tell you this? Didn't we just go over this? And uh, first thing that came to my mind when you, when you talk about Martha's comment that there is a stench of death in there. And recently, uh, thank you, Deacon Miron, for the homily on Wednesday where we talked about uh, the cleanliness and how, how sin makes us dirty and the stench and everything. I'm not flat out saying that Lazarus was a sinful man, but there's definitely a parallel there where you talk about the stench of death and the longer we take to repent, and the longer we take to cleanse ourselves, there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between that stench of death and what is happening in our spiritual life. 
you know, jokingly you said about six months that, you know, <laughs> stay away from me, thank you. And, and that's where Martha's head was that, man, it's, Christ, it's, it's not going to be a pleasant experience. Sometimes that can draw us to the devil's plot. If we start to believe that there's no way to get clean, there's no way to get around the stench, then you can get drugged down in that. But repentance and in, in Lazarus, uh, a miraculous uh, occasion was that he was called from the tomb. And a lot of people say, okay, so why did this all happen? It's four days after the fact. Why, why couldn't he, first, why couldn't he have saved him before he even died? Why couldn't he have done it in the first day, the second day? Well, there's a lot of uh, Jewish law or Jewish observance in that. After three days, the Jews considered it a closed case. They were, they were dead. And to be on the fourth day made it without any doubt, any, any kind of doubt, that he was in fact raised um, from the dead. They also talk about this foreshadowing where he's uh, foreshadowing to the point where he's, it's his own resurrection. That he died and he rose again. And there's a lot of like, you know, kind of good, feel good stories that come out of that. But with what's been happening over the last year, it's kind of an interesting predicament that we find ourselves in that the the most powerful verse in the in the in the gospel i don't want to say most powerful but the shortest is lazarus come forth and i think if you insert name here that's what all of our calling is that we are really being called out of our tombs over the past year a lot of us have been in our own little tombs we've been cut off from the world we've been cut off from a lot of things because of the pandemic that's been going around us. And from a personal reflection was this time last year, everything was shutting down. Businesses, churches, schools, everything was shutting down and we were cut off in the most important time of the year. We were halfway through the great fast. We were anticipating and getting excited, preparing ourselves for Easter. And then the switch was flipped and nothing happened after that. A lot of us took to our own causes to make sure that the spiritual aspects were there, and that was great. But a lot of people flipped the switch, and it was over. When I heard, when I was reading the, the, the scripture regarding Lazarus, and I read those words, it made me think, I really got shafted last year. I really got cheated in my own little way out of a very, very important time in the liturgical year. And I vowed that, okay, this year I've got to make up for it. And I think I might have shared that with some people that knowing what happened last year and knowing how it ended and knowing how beautiful the Byzantine liturgical services are through that time, it's like this year you have to make up for it. And it was definitely a challenge for myself. And I, I know that I'm human, so I, I, I falter all the time. But it's in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking that. You have it two ways. You can either have it this way or the way it was last year. And I will take this year over any of that. Yeah. I would take this year over that. Let's just say that. And so many people have been touched by the ongoings and happenings and have really dug down deep into their spiritual life to make sure that they make the most out of every opportunity that's given to them. So how horrible as the last year has been, I think that God has definitely blessed a lot of people with the ability to really see deeply down into their hearts to find what the most important thing is. And I, I truly feel that in the last year that though there's been a lot of challenges, there's been a lot of blessings that have come from it. So as Lazarus was raised from the dead, we know what happens the next day, that there's this huge celebration that Jesus finally enters Jerusalem. And you always have to have that negative side of the story a little bit though, because the, some of the, we'll call them the adults, the, the adults, not the children of the story, are furious about what's going on, and it's damaging their 
political, religious, whatever kind of agenda that they've set forth. And it's, it's frustrating them that we are slowly losing control of everything that we have and we have to do something about it at this point. And I, you know, we all know the end of the story, but it kind of struck me as very peculiar, peculiar or odd that throughout all the gospel at any moment they could have killed him. They, they could have done anything, but it's like all in good time. And that goes back to everything is done for the glory of God. Lazarus was in the tomb for four days. He wasn't saved before. Christ did that many times where he's cured people. He's raised them from the dead. But four days after the fact was unheard of. Working on changing Martha's heart. Yeah, I, I give, I, little, I poke at Martha, but when I really reflect on it, I'm, I'm Martha. I really am Martha. That even though I know what the potential is, I know that... Um, what I should be doing. I should be sitting at the Lord's feet and listening to his words. I'm still hung up in that hospitality factor. I'm still caught up in the, yeah, I know what you're about to do. I know what you're capable of, but I, I, I'm still not quite like full believing in that sometimes. And by no means am I saying I'm not a non-believer, but it's still like you, your, your heart knows, your mind follows. And sometimes you, you question that in your mind rather than in your heart. And sometimes it happens vice versa, where in your mind you, you have the knowledge and the strength to say this is um, what is going to happen. But then your heart is like, you really think so? Do you really think so? So there's, those are just kind of some of my words uh, regarding Lazarus. And by all means, if anyone has any, Samuel. Yeah, yeah. The great thing about passage I just checked uh, uh, that it's in, in John and um, I think it's a part of a series of um, Jesus signs uh, John the John the Evangelist creates a series of signs of Jesus turning back the curse and um, it's amazing that so many times <clears throat> people doubt about Jesus even claiming that he was divine but the way it's told in the story leaves no room for doubt because this is just one more example where Jesus is commanding. And in this one, it's, it's, almost like a, it's almost like a climax because now he's commanding over death. And um, so it's just one more time where Jesus is, sent, is showing, I have the power over the curse that formerly uh, ruled mankind and, and, and that's so crucial even for for our times myself being raised Protestant there's so many times where we have doubts about the power of God to sanctify us and make us holy because there's a real emphasis on the Lord saving us from our sins and even though that's true oftentimes we're just thinking we're just hanging on white knuckle grip until death uh, but but actually, Christ has the power over the curse, and he can command uh, life <laughs> back into our lives. And um, so that, that goes for to our, our spiritual lives, too. So it's just one more. Uh, like This is even more powerful. Like him raising a man from the dead is, is just one more thing to show that he has ultimate power. He can speak spiritual life and raise the spiritually dead. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and even to those points, like even today's gospel is a very, very good um, relation to what you've just spoken about is what we had a woman who was an adulteress and under the law, she was supposed to be put to death by stoning. And I, I don't, I like part of me is like that. That's pretty cool how, you know, Christ bends down and just kind of like, you know, what, what he without sin casts the first stone, then he stands up and people are gone. It's like, wow. I mean, yes, she was not there. I just I was basically listening to a couple courses from 
Jewish scholars that I guess are now fulfilled Jews that have come to Catholicism, and that was one of the topics that they had talked about. And they said, look, Lazarus, if you notice, that was a, an extremely great miracle that took place. So he says, whenever you see Christ doing a great miracle, it's because the people had great faith. You'll see all these other times where Christ won't even do a miracle because these people aren't worthy of the miracle. And uh, so they were always making that comparison of these people were great followers. These were Christ's inner circle. You know, this was his followers, his disciples, you know, all this stuff about that with Lazarus. And the other comment that he made about uh, Martha and Mary, he said, um, how do you phrase this? Mary heard the shepherd's voice. So she knew she needed Christ. So therefore she was listening to his voice, learning and trying to figure out how to do his will. Martha was more stuck in the world thinking of, you know, this is what I'm supposed to do, this, 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 this. Wasn't thinking about what was Christ's will for me? What was God's will for me? She already had her agenda. She was doing her will, even though it was good things that she was doing. She was driven to do her own will, where Mary was driven to listen to the voice of the shepherd. I think that's a very good point, too. That, that, that sometimes we lose track of that, maybe, that uh, we all have the same agenda. We're all moving towards, uh, to, to, towards God or towards heaven, what have you. But sometimes we... We have our own agenda or pathway to do that. And while, uh, you know, maybe one person is, look, I, I study the gospel X amount of hours per day. I'm very, very familiar with it. That, that person may be in their own way moving towards that. But somebody who's like, you know what, I built these uh, churches in, in, in my own way to move myself towards God. There's, there's different ways to do it. But definitely to your point, I mean, he was amongst them in one heard the voice, the other one heard more of like, I got to do this and this and this and everything else in between. Yeah, he, he went on to mention um, there was some Q&A involved with it. And uh, he said something about Mary and her faith. And he said, we understood in the early church that we were drawn to Christ for holiness for our family, not for our own self-righteousness. We understood that if we did the will of the Father, that we were going to instill, what we were going to be accounted for, was we have to instill holiness or provide a pathway for our spouse to become as holy as possible. And then the two of us are supposed to work together to bring our children to the, you know, the best spiritual outlet possible so they can do the will of the Father. And that's kind of what they were gearing their whole life around is the next generation is supposed to be better than the, the last, you know, as, as closer to Christ as possible. I was thinking of Martha this week, and uh, I, I realized when I was feeling accomplished, uh, getting various things done that had been like piling up for a long time. But you know, I'm home a lot now, so it's kind of like I'm picking these things off and getting some, put the smoke detectors up that I haven't done for three years. I mean, just silly things like that. And I was realizing I had a false sense of security because I was thinking about Martha, thinking I hadn't prayed yet that day. I hadn't listened to Jesus at his feet, listened to his word, read the scripture, any of it. And I had gotten all this stuff done. And I was like, of what worth was anything that I got done today, especially having not had prayed yet? So it was just like, a, I'm all secure and like, oh, look, I'm making progress. It's like, what kind of progress am I really making? Like, nothing, you know. I mean, it's important to get smoke checkers up, but it's, it's secondary, to, you know. <laughs> um, and then the other thought I was, uh, you had mentioned something about we got duped or something, or uh, shafted or whatever about the last year. I. I mean, technically, yes, like, you know, we were wronged, but I also think that it was a great mercy that everything was not taken away because it could have been and like that we are still alive to live another day, breathe another breath and, and still like kind of have time to repent, kind of like um, just thinking like had that not happened, if I would have been more complacent um, during the year with my faith or whatever and not thought about, oh, this is temporary. I could lose at that time mass liturgy, you know, at any moment I could lose my life at any moment, a kid, anything, you know, so it's kind of like, well, maybe it was good that I got shafted, you know, I don't know. But, uh, 
It worked for good. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. God took the evil and made it, made it good yeah. to come out of it. And at that moment, that's what it felt like. But like I said, and we, mm-hmm. we talked about already, it's like, this is to give glory to God. And I think that's where we're all kind of at right now. And I think that, yes, exactly to your point, that that happened for a reason. And I was oh, able yeah. to grow more spiritually through that. And thank God for that. Every moment of that. Because... It definitely showed you something, a different avenue, mm-hmm. where it felt I'll like say it's like the death of Lazarus. Right. It's like for the benefit of Martha, in a way. Oh, uh, yeah. Sure. And um, the uh, the in, the the injustice is is always a call for my own repentance, like Jesus saying, you know, you're. You're asking the question about the Tower of Siloam that fell on, fell on all these people, and you ask yourselves, was it was it because of their sins? And he says, I'm telling you, if you see something happen like that and you don't think I should repent, then you're going to suffer the same fate. I remember I want to share one very short homily I heard on this gospel, and it came from my cantor. He was. Well, relatively older guy at the time, my second parish. And usually we read this gospel uh, over the tomb before burial. And uh, so he was, he heard this gospel many, many times because he served many funerals. And uh, when we were returning back from cemetery once, and he was in my car and he said, Father, you know what? Uh, what I learned from the gospel, I said, well, what? It's good to be friend of Christ. <laughs> and I said, well, well yes, for sure. <laughs> Look, he can wept over you. He can raise you. It's really worth it to be, to be friend of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and I told myself, oh my, this is, from this older man, I think this is the best sermon I ever heard, mm-hmm. you know on this topic because in this simplicity he said something very, very important and uh, well thank you for this reflection and I think that it might be impulse for it it, it is for me, it is for I think for everybody maybe it's impulse that well to be sure that I am friend of Christ because he will be weeping over me always, and he will be raising me from raising me from death always. Yeah. It says in the uh, matins and vespers for the presentation of liturgy. Uh, it says that this dialogue with Christ and Martha and uh, Mary, he. Christ says, my friend Lazarus, my friend Lazarus. Mm-hmm. And even uh, I would talk to you about one of the like Orthodox chants where they take this dialogue and make it more beautiful. And they say, they sing that Christ is saying, my most beloved friend, Lazarus. And I had kind of like trouble with it because I couldn't find anything <coughs> in the scripture uh, Except his apostles, beloved. Why is he saying it? And connection with uh, his death and resurrection, which four days re- reminds us for 40 days. And well, my spiritual father told me that, well, <laughs> it stole my idea that we need to become his friends. And the death of Lazarus is, is really the last moment for us to really die to sin. And be born with Christ again, and to live that that horrible week for Christ, so we can await a resurrection for Him. So, yeah, there is no other way, just to become His friends, and so we can be called His, so He can call us beloved. It's interesting that you say that because Father Altman mentioned, uh, I think it was Father Altman. Somebody asked a question about comparison, like, hey, we're getting ready for Easter, and last year we couldn't have it, exactly what you were talking about. And he goes, yeah, what do you think last year was? You know, everybody was real silent. He goes, it was a forced fast. 
You thought you were fasting? That's a real fast. You got them taken away from you. How's your soul? Is your soul ready, you know, to have him taken away from you? That was a reality check, you know? And it, it, I never thought about it that way. Because that really was a forced fast. Someone else was telling you, no, you can't receive yeah. it. That's uh, interesting you say that <laughs> you say that because uh, that's something my wife and I have talked about a lot and not in those exact words, but just the fact that it's like we we had, you know, our routine and obviously church was a very big part of it and it was just taken away from us. And, you know, everybody responded in this this different way of, of how are we going to uh, set things up and build a new routine given the, the restrictions and, and everything. And. You know, we've noticed with our friends, some people who are obviously uh, the faith is not as important now as it seemed to be two years ago or, you know, a year before everything happened, we'll say. And there's other people who it's it's renewed and it's it's stronger. And, you know, just like a fast where if you're, you're putting that uh, that effort and that spiritual conviction into kind of exercise and strengthen yourself basically it's it's kind of that, that one or two ways do you quit when it gets too difficult or do you continue and grow stronger and you know for for a while it was we felt like it was too difficult just to be completely frank and honest like we were like what do we do and as soon as our, our son was born it was like well we have to get him baptized it's non-negotiable and we have to you know come back to church and uh, like this has to be a part of our lives again it's going to be tougher now than it was when we stopped because we we haven't been exercising that part of us spiritually in the same way and that's fine and, and we had the conversation we knew what was going to happen and, and you know it's been a you know, it's certainly been rewarding uh, but it, it's you know, my heart goes out to the people, and I do pray for for those I know who didn't make that decision for one reason or another yet, and I hope that they do soon. I became a rebel after when we were shut down. After a few weeks, I told Father, "I'm gonna come back and serve." Right? Yeah. It's just 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 a three or four. That's all. All yeah. there, right? <laughs> I serve on Sundays. I just stay away. <laughs> Well, <laughs> <laughs> is there something new? Yeah. Something. <laughs> but no, even in that, I mean, you know, thank you very much because you kind of, uh, maybe uh, several hearts were there, but they just couldn't find the strength to make that jump. And then, I mean, I know, I don't want to say divine intervention, it didn't take that, but it took uh, one message that says, hey, uh, the Feast of St. George is coming up and I think it'd be appropriate if you would come and serve. And I'm like, sure, yeah. Can I bring the whole family? And it's like, duh, yeah. <laughs> but that's where we really thought it, that it was going to be a temporary thing and we did, we, we want to do our part. We, we, you know, we want to do our part to make sure that we ensure the safety of a lot of people. And, um, and it's still our goal. We, we, we don't want to, you know, we don't want people to die because of our lack of uh, caring or anything like that. And, and no one ever had that intent. But there comes a time when you start to see it in a different light. And I think that's kind of where I was about that time that I, I saw as a little bit different than just having a um, a pandemic going on. Well, you guys are definitely doing something right. I can tell you that. Because you're spiritually feeding my family. All of it, you know. From the lay men and women to the to father and father and Deacon Myron. And I was just joking around with father the other, last night. My daughter and I were out staying in the deck on Saturday. And my wife has such, got such a crazy schedule at the hospital. She's always used to saying, do you want to go to Liberty you know, Saturday night? Or Sunday morning because of my schedule and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And my youngest one didn't even break a sweat. She's staying and she looks around and she goes, 
we're Byzantine now, Mom. We're hardcore. We do Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife was like, did you just hear what she said? I said, yeah, I heard it. <laughs> And so, so that you're impacting my children, so you know what I mean? Uh, it's, that is huge when you can, I don't know if you want to use the word provoke or bring out the, you know, the Holy Spirit or just by action and example. And they're obviously hearing the shepherd's voice through Father because they're like, Dad, it's 5.30, we better get ready for liturgy. It's at 7 p.m. You know what I mean? They're conscious of that without me setting an alarm or writing something on the calendar. That's huge in my life. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think at some point this whole thing, because, you know, Father, you can assess that it's not always been that way, maybe. Mm-hmm. But there, there are a lot of people who are now taking their faith a lot more seriously. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it was like, boom, like this last year. I'm talking over right. time where there are families. Uh, look, um, you asked how the men's group got started earlier. Mm-hmm. At that time, there were my son. We had one on the way. Uh, no, not even one on the way. And there might have been one other child in this church. Today, there were 90-some people, and a third of them were children. Mm-hmm. That is... Huge. That is wonderful. the... It, it's wonderful, yeah, absolutely. But it is the result of something greater than us. Definitely. That sure that we maybe came an extra hour before and prayed. We uh, started using the sacrament of reconciliation more seriously. But, and the long and the short of it, that it's a bigger thing that's just what's in our power. God is sending your family, your family, your family. I can go on and on for some, some purpose or some reason. And thank you guys for coming. I mean, I, it is definitely an inspiration that my wife and I were depressed. And I'm, I'm not saying slightly depressed. We were depressed that who is Jeremiah going to grow up with in this parish? And we prayed on it. But... Man, did he answer. That's all I can say. Man, did he answer. And thank God for that. Well, Craig and I, coming from a similar Roman background, just like Anthony, there is something different about this parish, for sure. And it's it's been a spiritual explosion in our family. For sure. So we're, you know, as much as you're thanking us, Randy, we thank you guys for laying the foundation and being so gosh darn welcoming. Holy cow. Like, you know, I mean, our first come time from the liturgy, we were standing around like a bunch of dumb Romans not know what's going on. <laughs> and, and Patrick, is Patrick here? Patrick comes over and hands us the little book to like help guide us and it's just like, it's been a thousand of those. It's it's you sending me stuff via YouTube and you yeah. know, just just welcoming and it's it's really resulted in a spiritual growth for my wife and I and, and an interest in my, for my children and we love you guys. So we're not Christians yet but it's, it's, it's been, to your point earlier, it's like, Kind of, and not to get into politics, kind of being asked to stop going to our former parish because of the pandemic and our approach to it and searching for a spiritual home and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and then landing here, it, you know, this is just, this is where it's supposed to be. And it's never been more apparent. I'm sure Craig could agree and Anthony, I'm sure you would as well. So, so thank you guys. And our cloud of witnesses, the icons that are on the wall. Mm-hmm. St. John Chrysostom's one, St. Basil the Great. Now, St. Basil the Great, we celebrate liturgy through the Great Fast and a couple of other occasions. Look, they wrote the liturgy. Sure. We're celebrating it, okay? Yeah, right. yeah. And, and by all means, go say a prayer. Hey, sure. and ironically enough, they're both on the altar, so you can make your way on up there anytime, too. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No, no, no. no. You're the second person they ever asked me about. Oh, I'll bring Mark with me. <laughs> there you go. Good. Good. No problem. Good. Yeah. And I, I think, I hope you guys don't ever lose sight of it. I doubt that you ever will. But to back up exactly what he's saying, kind of reminds me of that tripod right there. You know, we're coming here for the liturgy, and it's powerful, it's beautiful, it's, it's insightful, it's, it's awesome. But all of a sudden, you guys got these other two legs. You know what I mean? You got the, the parish life. And the support from you guys, you know, helping us along the way. And then you got, you know, Father talking about these church fathers that we've never even heard of before. And now we're getting these, you know, spiritual guidance and, and development through that. And, you know, great spiritual insight through confession. You guys got a great support system here. And I think as more people start to get, you know, a little taste of that, they're going to catch fire. 
We're spreading the word out there, so prepare for more, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. I mean, if I can it's add something to that, as, as obviously a convert like Samuel, like you're coming from Protestant background and just experiencing everything that that's here in our faith, especially like the, the the church fathers. Just there's the amount that I have learned that has helped me in my faith and my own personal struggles. Just with different questions I have that have been asked, you know, 1,500 years ago and answered very eloquently by people who you know, lived, breathed, and, and, you know, were so involved with, with Christ and the church. It's just, it's amazing to learn that and have that to be like a foundational aspect of, of, of my faith, like a supporting pillar almost, like you were saying. So I, I do uh, definitely echo that as well. I laugh at like, you know, former parish, you know, we, sh- we show up for liturgy, you know, we squeeze in confession over here. Last week, my family set a record. We were here seven days the entire week. And I said, you know what I mean? That never has happened before. You know, we might have been here five times, five days a week, you know? Seven days a week we were here for something. Oh, and it, was a, you know, it wasn't like it was an issue. It was like, yeah, we're excited about going. Oh, it's quiet. Oh, it's baking today. You know, it's liturgy today. It's part of our family's life now. Ironically, you say that leading up, we're almost at Holy Week. Yeah. Careful what you ask for. Yeah, 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 exactly. You said twice, three times a day. Two you days. said, <laughs> "Bring your pillow." Yeah. yeah. Nice. My little lad to this is that I'm, I'm probably one of the senior members, I guess, of, of the parish. So, yeah, I'm the average age of what we used to be. Yeah. So seven years old. That was the average age of our church. And seeing the younger generations come in is wonderful because we've got leadership. What really impresses me more than anything else, again, is seeing the children, because that's the future. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and if we don't have children in the church, uh, there is no future. So uh, that, I mean, I like kids. I mean, anybody knows me, I love, I love kids. And, and Bill, you, I and, mean, uh, look, you're you may be elevated in age, but in Gene, your your relics compared to that. <laughs> <laughs> but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but let me let me make it clear, okay? Let me make it very clear that these children that are on the altar with us, they see you guys as very much leaders and and father figures because you guys are giving them the knowledge and the fruit to to serve on the altar with uh, reverence. Reverence is the right word, and and I thank you guys for that because you taught me a lot too. I, I, I entrusted my children to you both at a very young age, and uh, eventually I got recruited too. But you guys have very much, if you, you talk about these children and how maybe or maybe not there will be vocations, just know that uh, we're praying for you guys because you are very inspirational in that. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> I I have to tell this that I am very I I would say proud but it would be seen so something like that in good way you know <coughs> because but one thing is that <coughs> when I came here and well uh, you know this was like named like black hole of the eparchy when I came here, before I came here, so. When they priest started to tell me that, well, Barbara is not so bad, you know, so I knew that I am going there. <laughs> 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 so probably, but it was, yes, it was a surprise for me because uh, you hear this like a little bit bad fame, but what I found here were were people dedicated to church, good people, willing to work and to offer they had. And when I saw it, I said, well, this will be a blessing over this parish because, well, maybe always, we might not do things perfectly, but if we want to do serve God 
and I can now I know everybody and 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 I I I can see all these works which is done behind the scene and these little sacrifices which cause that whole parish is 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 going smoothly you know uh, you said this relic there Eugene yeah yes. <laughs> he has uh, he, he now he has slave in the church but well he like to him and to vacuum church like every every week it's something what nobody sees but it says about love and many other people i can go from person to person everybody tries to somehow contribute this was really giving me hope and then seeing that how people started to respond for this like spiritual like inspirations and started to grow Still little steps. But with each little step which was made in individuals, this answer, I could see that their blessing came for the parish. You know, you, we all, you, you say that, well, you see younger generation, but well, who knows? Maybe, maybe you came because he is praying one hour before each liturgy in the church. You know? spending time and nobody sees that but it is amazing encouragement for me i can see ladies coming to the church you know when they are before baking and they come to greet christ in the eucharist and to say prayers and and more and more i can that that we we are i i see people growing like each year we cannot make jumps in spiritual life in spiritual life there is a progress, little steps, a lot of little steps. But making these steps, we are creating like space for Christ's grace to work among us and, and maybe to prepare good environment. Uh, I remember, I don't know, it was an advisory board meeting here or somewhere else. I used this, some kind of analogy that we try to find for our children the best schools, best environment when they can grow. I think that God does the same. He really sends people to good schools of spirituality or something. Because, look, we, just to make uh, one point that if there were times that we wanted someone to fix our name and something, and we we gave out over ten thousand DVDs about parish, you know, to spread word about over ten thousand. I know because I made them. <laughs> <laughs> I copied that, and my wife was packing. The... Nothing. Everybody who came to our parish was somebody who was new through marriage or just Samuel just he showed up for resurrection Martin once and even he came like one hour before you know but and and many others new members who slowly started to come they didn't come because of these DVDs or advertisement or something it was really strange for me so we stopped with that because well it didn't work and uh, with each of you who came during years, Jacob, you, you too, your family just show up one Sunday, and next Sunday, while well, we are staying here, I said, okay. It was like, from, from where did you come, you know? It was, it was like, always a miracle for me. But we have to remember that if God puts us together, you know, if he calls call us to this community, let's we should be aware of responsibility. That well, my growth will create this place, place of God's grace, when other can find their home too. It's not about growing that big barrier or something. Many people, it's just to through our personal responsibility for our salvation. We might create this 
environment when the others can find their salvation. And this should be the, the point. It doesn't matter if parish has little people or another or lot of or whatever. Parish is real parish when people where people can find this nourishment and through not perfect people. You know, like through not perfect environment. And and it is responsible for us all to and to to really realize that Many things depends on if I am friend of Christ or not. I stopped. I have to tell you a quick story. You talk about Usher Valley, so I killed myself. <laughs> 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 I never forget this. We, we, we had a funeral here a long time ago. Oh. Long <laughs> and Bill and I were sitting in the, in the pew <laughs> for, the, for, the, uh, for the funeral. And before the funeral started, Father came over and asked us, you guys, would you help me serve? I go, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to serve such a little kid, okay? And, but I felt so bad watching Father up there with his book of incense and all by holy oil by himself, okay? I felt so bad about that. that it just ate away. So a few weeks later, I asked my star serving. And it's like, that's how I got served because, because of that. Of that, you know, that bill still came in later on, you know, but, but, uh, yeah, that, yeah, we were scared because, oh, my God, I'm going to serve you. I have to tell him, he lost his power, Jim, <laughs> because he w- was serving during weekdays, yeah. you know, not Sundays, because we had a lot of on Sundays. The uh, but I then was... he served on Sunday, by mistake, always, following week, we had funeral, somebody died. <laughs> somebody died. It was like five or six it times happened that, that when he served on Sunday, Somebody died, so we nobody wants to serve <laughs> on <laughs> Sunday. Well, yeah, and then slowly he lost his power. Yeah, I had that power. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess the uh, as we found out here, Lazarus was a great friend of Christ. We too should strive for that. Thank you.